Congregation, if you'll turn now, turn in your Bibles to the uh, book of Revelation for the reading of the Word of God. The book of Revelation, chapter 2 of God's Word. And the topic of the uh, message tonight will be the Lord overtures his lovely church, uh, his loveless church to repent. This is a message that uh, perhaps you have in sermons by your own pastor that you've heard messages on this uh, particular church. I trust that by God's grace it may be something good or something that you haven't considered may be brought to your attention tonight. Revelation chapter 2, starting with the first verse. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say that they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And may God the Holy Spirit see fit to bless his word to our hearts and minds here from this second chapter of the Apocalypse. So our topic tonight is that the Lord overtures his loveless church to repent. Now one of the uh, responsibilities of the moderator of our own uh, reform classes out here in California, classes being equivalent to presbytery, is to read and to evaluate the various pastoral reports that are written and then submitted every year, just prior to the meeting of Presbytery. That particular responsibility fell to me for about 17 years. And in writing up the report year after year, I was influenced by other moderators, other presidents of uh, classes or Presbyteries, whose job was very similar. And invariably, what would happen is that after summarizing the reports, together with all of their strengths and their weaknesses about the health of the congregation, the moderator would conclude with a, the following assessment, and I include myself in this as well. Something like this would be said. Nevertheless, the three marks of the church, the preaching of the word of God, the proper administration of the sacraments, and the exercise of church discipline are evident throughout our churches. Now I suspect that uh, when, whenever that was said, that there was a massive collective sigh of relief from all, everybody concerned, all of the different elders and the ministers that were present, because no one wants to be indicted, no one wants to be singled out. The idea was that if the three marks are present, then uh, sometimes what happens is that we have a quantum leap of logic and that being that, therefore, because the three marks are present, therefore, the underlying health of the congregation must be healthy as well. Now, for someone to assess the health of the church is a very tall order. And this is especially so because a minister doesn't possess the omniscience that is necessary for such a thorough review. Also, the minister himself is a part of the very congregation that he assesses. He sees everything through his own grid, 
which could very well be jaundiced or biased. When the Lord walks among his churches, that includes his angels, the ministers, the, the stars of the congregation. So that sometimes what happens as the minister himself can be a problem within the congregation. So we can see the marks. The marks might all be there. But one thing is for sure, we cannot see the hearts of God's people. And plus, our swagger isn't the same as the swagger of Jesus when he walked among the seven lampstands here in Revelation chapter, chapters 2 and 3. Remember the, the dictum found from the 1 Samuel chapter 16, and that is that man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So Lord Jesus Christ walks as the omniscient Son of God, knowing everything about each one of us. He knows every one of you exhaustively, from your circumference to the radius of your being. He sees things that the angel of the church, which I believe refers to the minister, doesn't see and cannot see. And sometimes the problem in the church is both the minister as well as the congregation. Now this seems to be the situation here in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, where Jesus writes to these seven churches. Now today's message will zero in on the first church, Christ's letter to the church at Ephesus. And I hope to uh, convince you that the disease that hampered Ephesus is mentioned first, primarily because her sickness might very well sabotage all of the other churches. Also, I believe that this message is of colossal importance. It's exceedingly practical, and its implications apply to, to both churches as well as the individuals in the congregation. The text is primarily verse 4. Nevertheless, I have something against you because you have left your first love. Now, before uh, delving into the uh, exegetical water of this particular verse, let's just go back and look at the context of this church at Ephesus. Ephesus, you may know, was a very large city in Asia Minor. It had a population of about 200,000 people. And it was uh, occupied in a very famous uh, trade route. It was about 50 miles from the island of Patmos, where uh, John, of course, wrote the Revelation. The city was also famous for idolatry. There was uh, the worship of Artemis, the uh, Diana of the Romans. And there was also there uh, a magnificent temple, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. In this city, the Lord had planted his church. It was a good church. It had a good start. This church was shepherded by some of the eagles of the Christian faith, like Paul, Aquila, Apollos, Timothy, the Apostle John, etc. Now, the name of the angel or the star of this church, the minister who pastored there, is not revealed to us. But this angel is God's messenger, that is, the pastor of the congregation. It's interesting that only one pastor is specified in the letters to all of these uh, seven churches by name. That is, if we can call her a pastor, and that would be Jezebel. Some people think that she was a Jezebel. Jezebel was the, the pastor in Thyatira, or perhaps she was the wife of the pastor, which might be more likely. And what's significant is that Ephesus is first because of its geography. It was the first leg that a, a traveler took to visit the other six cities and the other six congregations. If you worked for the Persian post office, you would begin your route in Ephesus and end up at Laodicea. Now the Lord Jesus Christ has a number of very positive things to say about this congregation. He walks uh, among the churches and uh, he, he notes, he notes uh, these, these things. He holds the seven stars, it says, in his right hand as he walks among them. And this brings me to a very telling point, something that needs to be said, lest to be lurking in our, in our own minds some mutinous treason against the Lord. 
Although the Lord walks among his churches, this does not mean that he polices the churches. The policeman's job and the job of the Lord is completely different. The policeman's job is to look for infractions of the law, either felonies or misdemeanors and other lurking crimes. If he pulls you over on the freeway, check your license plate, ask to look at your driver's license and so on and so forth. Sometimes even perhaps might even ask you to open up the trunk of your car. You know that he's looking for a crime. Well, the Lord is not a policeman. He's more like a gardener who revels in the glory of his garden, or like the Lord at creation, who uh, after, after the creation, you remember, he perused the art of the creation and was satisfied, and he saw that everything was very good in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. And I remind you that you yourselves are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had prepared before the world began, as Paul tells us in Ephesians 2.10. It's interesting that the Greek word there for workmanship is poiema, which uh, is the origin of our word for English word, of our English word poem. Your God's poem created unto good works. So this explains why Christ walks among us. He rejoices in and he cherishes the fruits of his garden, his vineyard. He delights in seeing fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, all to the glory of God. You can read all about that, the vineyard, in Isaiah chapter 5. And it's interesting that immediately after the resurrection of the Lord, that the women took Jesus as the gardener, you remember much like God was uh, the gardener in the Garden of Eden. What does a gardener do? Well, one of the things that he does is he delights in his garden. He savors its fruit, cornucopia. He walks through the garden because he delights in his, its splendor and its glory and its beauty. He's refreshed by what he sees. And so never forget that the Lord expects you to bring forth much fruit and that your fruit might remain. I like to say the Lord is looking for amber waves of grain in our lives. And of course, gardeners may also spot something that threatens the garden, like weeds or thorns or aphids on roses or the bull weevil on cotton. You can go on and on with the list of various uh, enemies of uh, good agriculture. It's sort of similar to an old phrase from the 17th century that you probably have heard before, and that is, wherever God builds a church, you know that the devil builds a chapel near it. Well, then let's look at some of the positives of this church. <clears throat> First of all, the church here was busily at work. <clears throat> this is mentioned here several times by the Lord. They worked long and hard uh, <clears throat> And uh, perhaps uh, they had aced all of the other churches in this regard as well. Just as Paul, we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, that he worked, he worked uh, more abundantly than all of the other apostles put together. All of the other apostles put together. Of course, he ascribes that all to the grace of God. This church at Ephesus was composed of drones, that is, beavers, their, their work ethic was unimpeachable. Protestant work ethic before the, the, the era of Protestants. Not only that, the Lord says that this church had discerning spiritual antennae. They could smell the ugly rat of heresy a mile away. Look at verse 2. You cannot bear them which are evil, and you have tried them which say that they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. Now, this uh, particular word, liar, is not very politically correct today. In fact, we don't even hear it in the courts anymore. But uh, anyone who claims to be an apostle, by definition, is a liar. The pope claims to be Peter's successor. He's a liar. The, uh, the, the Church of the Latter-day Saints has 12 lying apostles. 
What is an apostle? Well, one of the qualifications to be an apostle is that you would have had to have seen the Lord. Anybody who comes forward and says he's an apostle, that would be one of the areas of examination that you might apply to him. It's often said that the only thing that's heresy today is a heresy trial, or that the only thing that's heresy is to say that there's heresy. The big word today, of course, in our culture is inclusive. Everything has to be inclusive. Anything that's exclusive is automatically bad. Samuel Stone's famous hymn, The Church is One Foundation, affords a good example of this. That particular hymn is no longer sung in many, many churches because it speaks of it in that, in that hymn of false sons in her pale and by heresies rent asunder. Well, they had heresy trials in Ephesus, and the outcome was to discover not apostles, but to discover liars. So this covers the third mark of the church, doesn't it? Church discipline. As far as we know, this particular church was doctrinally sound. It had to have been if there was church discipline, if they were zealous in bringing about heresy trials. And not only that, this church uh, uh, determined to do right. The church, this church would not be put off nor discouraged because of fierce headwinds. John says that she has persevered and endured and for mine's sake has labored and has not fainted. There was no uh, wearying and well-doing. There's an old phrase from the 17th century that's applicable here. You probably have heard it again. And that is there's a difference of being weary of the work and there is a difference of being weary in the work. Well, if you're weary of the work, there's something wrong with you, especially if it's the Lord's work. And all work is the Lord's work. There's also such a thing as being, being weary in the work when you're just simply fatigued. Well, there's no indication that these Christians were weary of the work. And what they did, they did for the glory of God, we're told. It's said that in the, in the world of business that the only thing that's omnipotent is perseverance. Or as Thomas Edison famously wrote, genius is 1% inspiration, 99% perspira perspiration. So this church performed its duties through thick and thin. Duty was a, a, a big word, the, 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 was the watchword in this particular congregation. And this, this church dutifully performed their responsibilities before the Lord. And not only that, you're told in verse 6 that this church hated evil. There, the Lord says, this you have, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which also I hate. So you can tell from the description here that in this church you had a very clear, decisive antithesis between good and evil. Sweet versus bitter, light versus darkness, good versus evil, Christ versus Baal. Now the identity of these Nicolaitans is not easy. There's similarity of meaning in the word uh, with the word Balaam in the Old Testament. So perhaps the Nicolaitan cult promoted marriages between God's people and pagans. This uh, very called operated in the church at Pergamos. Or perhaps they advertised the sin of fornication as well, just like Balaam. We're told in chapter 2, verse 14, because I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication. But this church hated that doctrine. The very notion of amalgamating the holy seed, God's people with unbelievers, was anathema and detestable in their own eyes. It's been said that association begats assimilation. And this Ephesian church, you see, recoiled against any kind of assimilation with the world and with worldly standards. 
Now, don't think that the Lord here, for a moment, is buttering up the Christians here, getting ready to squash them to the ground after buttering them up with negative uh, indictments. No, this church had true positive features, things that the Lord Jesus Christ commends them for, things that they did that were good, showing uh, that, that uh, they appeared to be a healthy congregation. It's much like the Church of Corinth, I suppose. The Church of Corinth, you remember, had a cargo of problems, even heresy. And yet Paul begins his letter to them. He says, I thank my God always for you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus. Now, after tallying all these good things, you would think that all was well in this church. Indeed, how could it not be? Certainly to the naked eye, these marks screamed a healthy church. The three marks appeared to be there. Well, there's one flaw in the diamond, one major flaw, or better, there's a worm in the, in the red apple threatening to devour the produce because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little evil grows. Christ says in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. So in spite of, uh, of the graces that God's Spirit worked in them, there was a huge negative, a, a monster sin, a Frankenstein within the congregation, if I can put it that way. A sin so colossal, so gargantuan, that it threatened to douse the flame in the church altogether. And the amazing thing is that none but Christ saw it. It was a disease that only the great physician was able to to perceive. This church had left its first love. Now, in order for us to understand what exactly is being said here, we should uh, take a look at that, the Greek verb there for left, left its first love. It's often imagined, and I want to underline this statement with a red crayon. If I had one up here, that's what I would do. But it's often imagined that the church at Ephesus had lost its first love, or that the first love of the church had faded, withered like a brown head on a rose bush. But that misses the force of the Greek verb here. No, the church at Ephesus had left its first love. That's what it says. Now, the Greek verb there, aphiemi, means to leave or to forsake, almost like it's implying a divorce of some sort. In other words, this sin was willful. You don't lose your first love, you leave your first love. That's, that's the drift, that's the thought. For example, when a man unlawfully divorces his wife, he doesn't lose his wife, he leaves her. Or more accurately, he forsakes her. The two grounds for divorce in the scripture are fornication and desertion. In fact, this very verb is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11, and is translated divorce. Listen to what Paul says. But even if she does depart from her husband, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. There's a Greek verb. So it's very important that, that, we, that we understand what is being said. In a marriage that's on the rocks, the innocent party doesn't, uh, doesn't say that she lost a husband. She says that her husband left her, forsook her, abandoned her. And the man who abandons his wife shouldn't say that he lost his wife he should own up to his responsibility and say that he left his wife. He forsook her. So you see, the sin of the Ephesian church was willful, intentional. The church willfully puts away its first love. That's the drift. So what exactly does it mean then to leave your first love? And how do we apply this to ourselves individually? Well, to use a modern term, I'm, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, Alienation of affection. That used to be used all the time in divorce courts. 
I'm not sure if it's used very much anymore, but alienation of affection is a big term in divorce courts, like having a bad marriage. There's alienation of affection. That's exactly what happened with this church. This church had somehow or another had lost sight of the beauty of the Lord, the graciousness of the Lord. There was alienation of affection. Even though, you know, they had gone through, apparently through all of the, of the motions, jumping through the hoops, doing all the right things, but not because she was motivated by supreme love to God and to his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. It seems that this church reduced the Christian life to a series of, of wooden mechanical du uh, duties. This church externally conformed itself to Christ, but internally her heart was vacuous. It was on empty with respect to the love of God. So you see, the Christians in this church, in spite of all their explosive zeal, their perseverance, their work ethic, their energy, were no longer bowled over by the love of God in Christ Jesus. Well, Paul wrote, remember, to the Galatians and to us, and he said, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith that works by love. At first, it seems incredible that this is possible. But it is possible. Christ himself says it is possible. In fact, I can illustrate this from the Old Testament. Jeremiah the prophet indicts Israel for forsaking, he says, the love of your betrothal. The love of your betrothal in chapter 2, verse 2. Which means that Israel's first love was abandoned. Israel was God's wife, but Israel was unfaithful. So what then does the Apostle John then mean when he says that you have left your first love? Well, your first love is when your heart was so conquered by God's redeeming love in Christ that you sort of fell in love with, with Christ, the bridegroom. And when Christ ascended into heaven, it's as if he took your heart with him into heaven. So now your affections are, are, are in heaven where Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God the Father, as Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3. When you first came to Christ, you were swept off your feet by love to him and by his love to you. There was once a time in your life where the, the simplest hymns of, the simplest stanza of, of, the, of any hymn, like, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so simple stanza like that was just so beautiful to you. Or as Paul wrote, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You can almost put an exclamation mark at the end of that verse. Or the magnificent thrust of the hymn, Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Love of every love the best, rolling like a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. All around me, underneath me, is the current of thy love, leading onward, leading homeward to thy glorious rest above. When I first came to Christ, way back in April of 1965, I met a young man, by the, his name was Chuck, who became a Christian a little bit later, just a little bit later than myself. And one day, in the uh, local government high school in Southern California, Chuck did something extraordinary. I st still remember it to this day. That's why I'm using this as a sermon illustration. He raised his hand in class, and he asked for permission to leave the classroom. And permission was granted to him by the teacher. But Chuck didn't go very far. He stayed out in the hallway, and he paced back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Something was eating away at Chuck. And it wasn't uh, a bad lunch or worms or something like that. It turned out that Chuck, by his own confession, was so gripped by the love of God 
that he had to get out of the classroom. He couldn't concentrate on anything else. He was bowled over. It was as if he had a crush on the Lord, for lack of a better expression. He was so smitten that he couldn't concentrate on his studies. Now, I know you could chalk that up to some extent to the, his immaturity in the faith, I suppose. But still, one has to appreciate the great love that Chuck had for the Lord, that uh, he couldn't sit still in the classroom. Samuel Rutherford wrote of Christ these words, If you saw Jesus standing on the shore, holding out his arms to welcome you on the land, you would not only wade through a sea of wrongs, but through hell itself to be with him. Think only of the Apostle Peter, remember, who jumped ship to swim or to, or to wade to the Lord Jesus Christ and confessing three times that he really did love the Lord. And he was never, he was never the same man after that. Peter, of course, returned to his first love and never left it again, even requesting, if the church historians are, are right, even requesting to be crucified upside down. Now notice here, the Lord Jesus is the one who underscores their fault. He brings it to their gaze. He makes this sin particularly heinous. It's Jesus' complaint or his covenant lawsuit against the church at Ephesus. And this remembers something else. What is the church but a beautiful bride cleansed and sanctified by the blood of Christ? You see, Christian marriage clues us a little bit about the possibility of this sin that we have here. Let me illustrate this. A minister in our denomination many years ago said that he sat down with his wife and he asked her if she had to do it all over again, that is, to enter into the marital covenant, would she do it? It's a bold question. I don't know why he asked it, but that's why um, a moment of candor, perhaps, that's what motivated him. Well, his wife suddenly became very mute. There was no answer. And then she said something like, well, I don't know. Well, the minister was shocked to his boots. He decided at that time to triple down and to make his marriage work. He knew that something was seriously wrong with his marriage if his wife couldn't tell him that she loved him. She didn't say as the Shulamite did, for example, on the Song of Solomon, I am my beloved's and my beloved's is mine. Obviously, her love was, was gone, perhaps not altogether, but it, but it had faded. And this shows that your marriage can subtly disintegrate so that it might also become a, um, I don't know, a program of some sort or a series of heartless duties in your relationship with your spouse. If you want to try to understand what's happened, what happened to the church of Ephesus, look at your own marriage or perhaps someone else's marriage in order to give you a clue as to what was actually taking place. So the Lord, you see, challenges us here. The Lord says to us here, am I unworthy of your love? Is there something unlovable in me? Have I been a plague to you? Have I been a wilderness to you? Have I been a famine to you? Have I ceased being cornucopia? Have I ceased being an everlasting fountain to you where you can be refreshed? If not, then why have you left me? Why have you left your first love? This is, of course, alienation of affection. You see, an ever-fading love cannot be hidden from the Lord Jesus, either in your marriage or in your relationship with him, which is a spiritual marriage. Many, many times, many times, in this, uh, to these letters to the churches, in fact, in every one of them, the Lord begins by saying, I know your works. I know them. He sees what's behind them, what motivates us. God wants your heart. Like John Calvin, you're supposed to give your heart to him promptly and sincerely. That was Calvin's famous motto. Now, your condition may be unknown to others. It might even be unknown to yourself, as you may be lying to yourself. But there's no eyelashes that block God's vision of your true motives. 
Nothing escapes his omniscience or his, uh, the omniscience of his retina. He, he sees you when your duties are carried out lovelessly, either in the home or in the church. And he'll let you know about it as well. As Joel Beakey writes, a fading love may not keep you out of heaven, but we, can, but we can keep heaven out of our hearts if we fail in our love for Christ on the earth. And of course, the great thrust is that this Ephesian church was in danger of ceasing to be a church. The candlestick might be removed. Jesus might cease to walk in their midst. So you can see this is scary business that we have here. Now, here's a question for you. How did this happen? That the church had left its first love. How? Why? Why did it, why did it happen? Now, there's, that's a good question, and that's the one that we need to take a look at here. Well, the best answer that I have found is supplied by uh, Dr. John Owen. Dr. John Owen wrote, I'm quoting him now, that some leave their first love because they think that abiding in Christ is a plant that needs neither watering, manuring, nor pruning, but that which will thrive alone by itself. In other words, very little gardening is necessary other than the routine of going to church and assuming various poses in church sitting in the same pew, talking to the same people, parking in the same plot, spot in the parking lot. But scripture teaches that without, without daily nurture, your relationship with the Lord will absolutely and certainly wither. And this is especially true when there's negligible prayer, just enough Bible study to perhaps dab a little salve on our consciences and when you abandon the communion of the saints. Prayer in its simplest definition is simply conversation with God or friendly, loving conversation with God. You're not talking just about God, you're talking to God. You see, it's disaffection that keeps you from growing. And of course, this withering takes place gradually. It occurs in the, hidden, in the hidden chambers of our hearts, when we become lukewarm and then eventually frigid altogether. This is a daily constant temptation we all have. The hymn writer described it best when he said, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. So when we drift, so often we drift, we're drifters. There's an old story about a wife who complained that her husband never sat close to her anymore. And since he was the driver of the automobile, she, he turned and said to her, but, but dear, I never moved. If you feel far from God, you're the one who has moved. The Lord has, doesn't drift, we drift from him. And we make, we make decisions with, which cause us to, uh, you see, to drift from him. Things that cut down on our spirituality. To maintain our first love, we must place our hands on two oars. The first oar is that of believing, loving prayer. And the second one, of course, is reading the Holy Scriptures. And if you do that, then, you're ro then you'll be rowing toward Christ in the right direction. We need to remember that it's we tend to want to talk more about God than we do to talk directly to God. We heartlessly do our duties. There's no longer a fire in our bones, a subterranean fire, you see. Now, Christ's prescription for the Ephesian church is very, very simple here. There are three words uh, that summarize it, and here they are. Remember, repent, and return. We'll look at these closely. First, remember. John Bunyan tells us in his the Grace Abounding of the Chief of Sinners, it is profitable for Christians to be often calling to mind the very beginnings of grace in their souls. Ever done that before? You look back to the time when you were first brought to Christ and you say, 
What fire, what enthusiasm, what transformation, what zeal, what love? Well, remember. That's what the prodigal son did when he was in the far country. He remembered the hired servants of his father's house, the delicious food, the cornucopia that was there. And that's when he returned. Remember, in the Lord's Supper, which we took earlier, Christ commanded, do this in remembrance of me. So that's the first prescription that we have here. The second one is very simple also, and that is repent. The word repent shows the greatness of abandoning your first love. What a great sin this is. Remember, you haven't left your first love. I haven't said that. That, uh, or you have, I should say, I ha you haven't lost your first love, but you have left your first love. Left it. Losing your first love is made up sometimes of hundreds, if not thousands, of little choices, such as, uh, well, I won't read the Word of God today, I'm just too busy, or because of the tyranny of the moment, whisk you away to do other things which you think are more important. It's like Martha's abandoning the Word of God for kitchen duties. She skirted the one thing in the house that was the one thing that was needful for her, Christ said. And so the Lord commands us to repent. The fact that he does this shows the magnitude of our sin. So Christ is not impressed, here's the bottom line, with wooden obedience. He wants you to obey him from your heart and with love. And this is one of the problems with the word fallen, at least in modern parlance today. We talk about man being fallen or falling into sin. Sin isn't Humpty Dumpty falling from the wall. Sin is not an accident. Sin is something that you and I willfully do. You fall into sin because you choose to do so. You don't lose your first love, you leave your first love. Now the word repentance means a transformation of mind, a change of heart. It's a gigantic attitudinal change that takes place within us. Repentance isn't denying yourself what in your heart, of love, heart you really love, but hating in your heart which you know is wrong. Your works that you do are not the repentance. Your works are the fruit of your repentance because repentance is an attitude of hatred towards sin and love towards God. And that's why you turn, just like the prodigal, turned back to his father's house because he remembered how good his father was. Repentance is when you acknowledge your sin, when you hate your sin, and when you, uh, when you turn or forsake your sin. Well, the third uh, part here is that the Lord wants us also to, re, uh, to return and to, rem, uh, and to remember the future. There's two magnificent incentives that should move you to return to your first love. They're very simple, but they're wonderful. First, <clears throat> you'll, per, uh, you'll partake of the tree of life. God promises you the tree of life, which means that you'll have <clears throat> eternal uh, <clears throat> communion and fellowship with God. Just as God communed with Adam and Eve in the garden when he walked in the garden in the cool of the day, God's walking in the cool of the day means that he, that he met with them regularly, just as you should commune with the Lord regularly. And then secondly, you're promised nothing less than paradise. Now there's a promise. Heaven itself. What is paradise? But, to, but again, communion with God forever. And this is precisely how the Lord assured the converted thief on the cross. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Not Notice, not just in paradise, but with me today in paradise. So let me conclude by saying that leaving your first love has ripple effects. <clears throat> I've already said that one person or one reason the Lord begins with Ephesus is because it's the first church on the postal route. You begin with 
Ephesus and you end with Laodicea. But there might be another reason too, and here it is. The sin of Ephesus, the sin of leaving your first love might very well escalate and disease, bring disease to all of the other, to the other six churches, finalizing in Laodicea. Ephesus is really the first stop on the line that leads to greater declension, ending with the lukewarm worship of the Laodiceans. And when that happens, <clears throat> bad things happen. That means that God will spit us from his mouth. And they'll spit us from his mouth because then we become sickening to God. And the church, the true church, becomes <clears throat> nothing more than filthy spittle. Church may be there, <clears throat> The church may be there, but it's not a true church, not a church that palpitates with the life and the love of God. St. Augustine once said, the corruption of the best is the worst. There's nothing worse than a bad church. So congregation tonight, <clears throat> beware of the insidiousness of this sin, of putting away your first love. The minister may not notice it, <clears throat> In fact, the minister may, might even be an accomplice to the crime, aiding and abetting this crime, especially if his ministry sinks into a kind of professionalism when he himself is just going through the motions. God not only commands us to preach the truth, but to preach the love of the truth as well. When you receive the truth, you're to receive the love of the truth. So your last love should be your first love, and your first love should be your last love. God not only wants us to believe the truth, I'll say it again, but also to love the truth, and to love the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Amen.